means uh, it's time to introduce our host here, which is me, Evan Barr. And um, I'm filling in for Andy Nakarado, our president, uh, who is sort of co-hosting with me. She'll, she'll jump in if, if I've missed anything, which I'm grateful for. And um, so we're gonna have some announcements here coming up. Uh, we are going to start recording this meeting. So um, is, is now the time, Andy? Sorry. The videos. Sure. And, yeah. So if you want to turn your cameras off and, and microphones off. Um, and then if you have any questions moving forward, uh, there is a chat feature and all of the, the questions uh, that are in the chat feature. Uh, will be answered at the end. Um, we'll also be putting links into the chat feature. Um, so if there's a slide uh, with you know further information, that'll be in the chat feature. Um, so yes, it will be recorded and you can find the recording on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, and it does have closed captions. Um, I did miss on the last slide, Andy. Um, if you, did you go back one? Sorry about that. Um, our, free, our feature presentation is going to be on native plants and eco philosophy uh, by Eric Fote, the natural resources director at the Naples Botanical Garden. Thank you, Andy. Okay, so first announcement native plant sales. Um, I'm the vice president and plant sales chair. So I'm happy to bring this announcement to you guys, especially. Uh, we've been doing several uh, sales at Cutting Horse Eco Center, which is run by the Coco Lobo chapter, which is the Fort Myers, uh, Lee County, excuse me, uh, chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. And they have a wonderful center there if any of you have not been there yet, uh, it is definitely worth a visit. They have established uh, plants in the landscape there so you can see what they look like um, and just enjoy walking through. And then as you can see in this photo, they have a nursery set up and, a, and conduct plant sales. So they've been kind enough to let us come and do native plant sales there. And they wind up giving us uh, a donation um, relative to the amount of plants that we've sold uh, and income that we've generated. So looking forward, our next Naples chapter sales days at Cutting Horse are Saturday, May 29th and Saturday, June 5th, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And we are seeking volunteers. Um, you may come out and help assist in the nursery, uh, showing customers plants, uh, walking them through the demo garden and assisting with the sales in other ways. Um, if you have any questions, you can email us, naplesnativeplants at fmps.org. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna pass it over to Andy to talk a little bit about these upcoming events. Thank you, Evan. So there are a couple of events going on virtually in the month of May. And the first couple that you see here are being put on by the Florida Native Plant Society at the state level. So for anybody who hasn't heard yet, the annual conference for the Florida Native Plant Society is this coming weekend. It is virtual. It's starting on this Friday, May 14th in the evening. And then there's a full day on Saturday and a full day on Sunday. So in the next slide, we'll give you some more information about the conference and how to register. And then the following weekend on Saturday, May 22nd, the Florida Native Plant Society at the state level again is holding the annual members meeting. 
And again, this will be virtual. And if you're already a member of FNPS, you should have already gotten an email about this annual membership meeting and the link to attend the meeting. This is where um, members will vote in the board members at the state level for the society. They will announce award winners statewide and give FNPS updates on activities. So that is Saturday, May 22nd. And then looking ahead to next month for our next chapter meeting, it will be on Wednesday, June 2nd. So we are planning to go back to our first Wednesday of the month for our chapter meetings. And just like tonight, you can join at six o'clock for optional social time and the native plant ID game. And then at 6.30, we'll start the announcements and the feature presentation for next month will be Ethnobotany and You by Heather Geenap. And a quick definition for ethnobotany, if you haven't heard that term before, it is the study of how people use plants. So uses such as using plants for shelter, for food, for medicine, or for other useful tools. And Heather Geenap was not only my past supervisor at Six Mile Cypress Slough Preserve, uh, where I worked in Fort Myers, but she was also really my personal mentor there. And she taught me how important it is to use my own senses and my own observations to learn about native plants. And um, Heather also has given really cool ethnobotany native plant tours at that preserve. Um, so she'll be pulling in all of those skills and uh, knowledge into our virtual meeting next month but she does have a plan to incorporate some sort of hands-on activity during the virtual meeting. So uh, stay tuned for how all of that's going to happen. We'll have more details in our next newsletter that will come out at the end of this month. Whoops. And then over to you, Evan, to talk about what's going on in July. Thanks, Andy. Uh, so in July, we will not have a chapter meeting. Uh, that's the one month that we take a break. Uh, but we are planning a native plant sale for that month. So stay tuned uh, with us uh, on the website or subscribe to our newsletter if you haven't already. And there will be more details about that soon. Okay, so this weekend, uh, very exciting. It is the um, 40th uh, Florida Native Plant Society annual conference. So it will be May 14th to 16th. Um, registration is $35. Um, gives you access to presentation recordings for up to six months. Um, we're proud to share that on Sunday, uh, Andy and myself are part of a uh, pre-recorded um, case study in chapter development. So it's featuring our chapter and the Naples chapter and the Coco Lobo chapter, which is the Lee County chapter. And it's a lot about how we are developing um, more and how we partner with them, how they've helped us, how we've helped each other. So. Uh, pretty interesting stuff, as, as well as a lot of the conference. Uh, there'll be a lot of, a lot of great things, as, as there is every year. So there is the website up there, and Andy will put that in the chat feature for you so that you may get more information if you please. Yes, I will start putting in the links in the chat as soon as I have finished sharing the slides. So just a couple minutes from now. Okay, so here, here's a look at our web page. Um, and the, what I want to point out about our web page, um, especially, is that if you do wish to uh, join our chapter, in the upper right there, you will see a button that says join us. So we encourage you to go to our webpage, fnpsnaples.org and, and join 
our chapter. We have lots of ongoings, lots of great information in our newsletters every month, uh, plant sales to find homes for native plants, um, and just a, a great community of people. So if you just want to get the newsletter, you don't have to be a member. And that is under the newsletter, e-newsletter column there on the right. Uh, you'll see the click here to receive our monthly newsletter. And we hope that you do. Next slide. OK. So again, welcome to our May 2021 meeting. Uh, I'm your host. Evan Barr, Vice President and Plant Sales Chair. Uh, our website is there um, to visit, if you please. And now is the time for our feature presentation. And I'm very excited to, uh, to be doing this, this introduction. Um, it's, it's really um, my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, Eric is a, the Natural Resources Director at the Naples Botanical Garden and has worked for the garden for 11 years. He works to manage the 90 acre native preserve there. Um, Eric has studied environmental studies at FGCU and had many wonderful teachers there that inspired him. He grew up in Naples and loves learning and teaching about plants native to Southwest Florida. Eric tries to see a plant in habitat to better know and understand them. Somewhat recently, Eric started learning more about mushrooms uh, and how they are opportunistically uh, documenting the fungi. Um, sorry, he is, is opportunistically documenting the fungi he grows uh, in the natural areas. Uh, when not doing stuff with plants, Eric is at the beach surfing or sailing or playing with his son Finnegan uh, with his wife Laura as well, trying to soak up his wonder and the world through Finnegan's eyes. I'd also like to add that um, Eric is a board member with the Friends of Fakahatchee. Um, and he is a very dear friend of mine. I've known him since elementary school and it's just a joy to, uh, to have him in my life and, and to learn so much from him about plants. So um, without further ado, our feature presentation, Native Plants and Ecophilosophy by Eric Fote. Uh, if uh, you're, and it looks like everybody's screens are off, microphones are off. Great. Eric, take it away. All right. <clears throat> um, can everyone hear me okay? Start there. Good on Evan, my end here, Eric. You can hear me okay, Evan? Um, oh, gotta take these subtitles off. So how does that screen look to everyone? Good? Also good. All right, so thank you for coming back uh, for another try at this. Uh, I know last Wednesday I was not feeling well and uh, we rescheduled. So thank you for everyone that you know tried joining last week and is here again. Um, this is a picture of me at our home here in Naples and uh, I'm in a tree fort that we built in a Royal Poinciana tree. <clears throat> and um, it's not a native tree, but uh, you know, I had thought about maybe when we first bought the house, like taking it down. I was like, oh, I could plant like a gumbo limbo or something, but um, it was just too beautiful of a tree and uh, it shades the house so well. But you can see that I left a little strangler fig that's coming from underneath the tree fort there. <clears throat> so there's a cool little native tree sneaking its way in there like they do. Um, so. Tonight, my talk is on native plants and uh, eco-philosophy. And to be honest, I'm still trying to wrap my head around eco-philosophy, like what, you know, what that is. But um, to me, I guess it is, you know, how, how do we behave in the world? How do we see ourselves in nature? Um, 
how can those thoughts guide our behaviors um, and, and all those sorts of things. So to me, it becomes almost like an ethic on how to live your life. Uh, and I think that's what philosophy is good for in general, is thinking deeply about things and then you know, using that in your life. Um, thinking is good, but action, thinking in action, I think is, is the, uh, you know, the best or, or the next, the next best step. So, <clears throat> so yeah, that, that's kind of a brief uh, idea of what we'll be talking about. And, um, I thought it'd be interesting since I'm speaking to the Naples chapter of the native plant society. Um, to maybe examine that word native plant and what it means and just ask a few questions about that definition. Because I'm speaking to the right group to do that, right? I, uh, you guys have all thought about native plants a lot. And I, I believe it probably guides your decisions and, and what you put around your house and how you see the world and where you like to go hike and all that kind of stuff. So I just like to examine the definition, if you'll indulge me, and hopefully we have some fun along the way. <clears throat> so I try to remember this. Uh, like I said, an eco philosophy should be something that guides your actions. And so I really liked how this was put. This is uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, and he's a, I think, Zen Buddhist monk and was very politically active as well and tried to bring the philosophy of Buddhism to, to actions, right? And um, he cares deeply about the earth and people and the planet. And I think, um, I really like these words. He said, our own life has to be our message. And so I try to remember that in my daily life that, um, you know, I need to I need to bring my ideas to action to really fulfill them and realize them. You can see he's he's sitting next to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, wow, what it, wouldn't that have been interesting to be sitting there at this conference? I'm not sure what it was from, but this picture came from Thich Nhat Hanh's website, which is uh, called Plum Village. And coincidentally, I have been studying meditation lately. And um, so I think that kind of influenced my decision on what to speak about tonight. So, um, yeah. All right, next slide. So before I read this definition to you guys, I want to um, introduce the artwork. This is by a friend of mine, um, Sarah Abelin. And it is of saw palmetto and cabbage palms in the background, and it's done in charcoal. And I think she just did such a wonderful sketch and captured the essence of those plants so well with just some lines and shading. <clears throat> um, Evan, I know you were talking about um, how to pronounce, you know, Latin names of plants. And uh, the cabbage palm I heard is actually pronounced sable. I've been saying it's sable my entire life, but... Um, I don't know if I can bring myself to saying it that way, though. So I might just stick a sable palm. Um, so, yeah, but I took this definition that I'm going to read to you from Mr. Smarty Plants, which is from wildflower.org, which is the um, um, Lady Bird Johnson Wildlife or Wildflower Center there. So uh, I thought it was good. In it. Oh, I'm sorry about that. So I'll go ahead and read this. I'm trying to figure out how to move my camera so I can read my own slide here. <laughs> okay. So it says, clearly there is no one size fits all definition of native plant. Although a closer inspection reveals that there are some common threads shared by most. The first common thread is the human factor. The human element is either implied in statements like occurred, grows, or evolved naturally, or stated explicitly in statements like not introduced by man without direct or, or indirect human intervention or prior to European contact. Native plant definitions that exclude humans or arbitrarily assign a point in time before which, but not after which, human intervention is allowed are, by default, 
definitions that assume humans are not part of the natural world. Nevertheless, the human exception appears to be a key and sometimes difficult to document criteria when assigning native status to a plant. So if this was in a non-Zoom format, I'd love to open that up to some thoughts, you know, because I'd love to hear different people's opinions on that. But, um, you know, we can't do that tonight. But um, I would challenge you to maybe think for yourself, do you agree with uh, this definition, which came from many definitions? I, I do know that he took these and kind of synthesized it from many definitions and took some some threads from each. But um, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, something I guess I wanted to ask was, um, sorry about that. I'm going to share this native plant too. Um, but I want to have, I had some questions about that. And I want to see, you know, what value is there in leaving humans out of the, de the definition of native plant? Um, because obviously uh, a lot of these plants were around before humans were around. Um, they didn't need us, but at the same time, you know, I do believe that humans are just as much a part of nature as every other creature. So, you know, you wonder, well, if that's the case, then what harm could this concept do? So say you believe in this definition that humans can't be involved in the definition of a native plant 1,000 years from now, 5,000 years from now, it doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> we're cut off. My other question would be, could you envision a scenario in the future where we were allowed back into this definition? You know, uh, how would we have to behave to be allowed back into this definition? Or do we not need to be included in the definition at all? Um, you know, but it is curious that all, all other mammals are included in the definition. Um, you know, a lot of animals can bring plants across borders, boundaries, across oceans. Um, so it's not just that we have the unique ability to move things quickly because, you know, at some point animals also would move, other animals would also move things. So those are just some ideas I want you to think about as we go forward here. This beauty right here is called, uh, sky blue lupin. And this came from an upland scrub in deep deep sand, like quartz sand. And uh, I just love this plant so much. It's fun to touch the leaves. <laughs> you know, um, Andy, you made me think about how your mentor told you to use your own senses and observations to learn. And uh, I love that. that. That is so good. And I think for an environmental philosophy and ethic, you know, some of those experiences that you learn from your own observations, that's the way to go and see how you feel about about these things. Um, I'm kind of torn. I don't know. Um, I like the native plant definition as it is, but uh, I have this nagging sense that uh, excluding us does something to our psyche at some base level, reminding us that we are separate. We are different. We're not to be included in everything and in, in definitions like that. Um, I could be wrong. So maybe at the end we can talk about a little bit in the chat or something. So um, I will, I will agree though, that we are, a, we are a weird species. Um, we do some, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I was driving by the other day on the way to the garden and I was like, wow, what, what is going on there? And they were spray painting the grass green and um I was like, wow, we're difficult. It is difficult to include us into the whole scheme of nature when we're doing things like this, in my mind. So, um, but rest assured, we all are, you know, live on this one planet together. And, you know, all plants are native to planet Earth. This photo came from NASA. And, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the overview effect, but it's the feeling that astronauts get 
when they see the earth for the first time from space. And I imagine it's a bit of a spiritual, mystical, religious, whatever word you want to use, awe-inspiring, to see us all together on one planet and realize that, um, you know, how lucky we are to, to exist at all. And so, you know, I, I feel like this overview effect could really inform our decisions moving forward about how we treat each other, but also the decisions we make about the environment. Um, Cause you know, it's all there, you, just one, one planet. And uh, actually there's Florida. I see it, the, the way they took the picture uh, has Florida there right smack in the center. So there we are. All right, so moving forward, this could have been another bonus question, Evan. Um, what is this weird creature that I've taken a picture of here? If you feel like it, you can put it in the chat if you know it. Um, let's see here. So that doesn't show up great on the screen, but um, this is actually saw palmetto. This is the horizontal stem of saw palmetto taken as a photo from above after a prescribed fire on Key Waden Island. And I wanted to, the next part of my talk, I wanted to talk about the saw palmetto because, you know, it's, it's the logo. It's our logo for the Florida Native Plant Society. Um, repens, the second part of the Latin name means growing horizontally, laying flat. And um, you can see that in that picture there. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about this plant a little bit. Sorry about that. I have two screens going, so I'm I'm learning how to do this. <laughs> so right now the saw palmetto has fruit on it. Um, has anybody tried the fruit? I wish you could. I wish I could see all your faces. <laughs> But, um, oh, it is a treat. I think, uh, yeah, if you're curious, actually, maybe you could wait till next week's talk with Ethnobotany uh, or next month's talk um, because I'm sure this plant may be included in that talk. And, uh, yeah, but don't take my word for it, as they used to say in Reading Rainbow. Uh, you know, you have to figure it out for yourself. So, Andy, kind of back to your own observations, you know, from your um, – that quote again to using your own observations and senses, you know, I could tell you what it tastes like, but until you taste it, you don't really know. So that's why I, 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 I love in the philosophical side of things is having your own experiences about things and then coming to your own conclusions. Wow. What a beautiful plant. I love, I just love everything about saw palmetto except walking through it when I'm, trying to get somewhere <laughs> this um, but yeah this picture was taken just recently it is in full flower and there's something like 300 insects that will use the nectar from saw palmetto and then when it makes its fruit another whole suite of animals uses it um, from bears to raccoons to you know I don't know so much about that but I'm sure it's, it's, it's a good list and uh, yeah, even humans in the past. And here is how it burns. It is an amazing plant. It is super durable, um, hardy. And this is a, a fire that I helped uh, Rookery Bay's team do on the northern end of Key Waden, where there's actually some scrub habitat, you know, some scrub and uh, scrubby flatwoods and and um, like this, and there's some beautiful uh, sand live oaks in this picture. And, you know, it's really interesting to see how a plant that is so green can just ignite and do a, you know, almost like an explosion of fire. Uh, they have evolved to actually have chemical compounds that are flammable in them. Uh, that's what they're meant to do. That's what they want to do. It probably keeps competition from 
from other plants shading them out when they have these hot, intense fires that burn quickly through there. Um, and there's me in my, my get up in the bottom right of the screen there with my Nomex fire gear on. I've really enjoyed participating and volunteering on prescribed fires, and I've learned so much about just plants in general from, from watching it. All right, so I thought this was apropos uh, to bring up the quarterly journal of the Florida Native Plant Society. Do you guys uh, read this much? Um, here is, um, oh, when was this? Well, oh, this was in 2016. So if you're curious about finding and reading this article that I'm going to um, tell, tell you about, you, could, you can look it up online. Um, I did not leave a link for this, but uh, you should be able to find it rather easily. So I'm going to talk briefly about um, all this. But before I do, Evan, can you bring up a, a, a question to the group so we can have a fun little quiz time? I sure can. All right. So. This question says, and this is curious, I wanted to see what you guys all, all felt like about this. How long can saw palmetto, Saranoa repens, live? 100 years, 250 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, or 5,000 years? So go ahead and submit an answer to whatever you think, and then we'll go from there. I'll let you know, Eric, when I see that everybody's wagered a guess. It's nice having this like support crew here. I love it. I feel. <laughs> We're happy to be of service. Thank it's you, nice Danny. having having two, even more than one. Yeah. <clears throat> Two heads are better than one, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh. So how's everyone doing? Is that... How many folks are with us? Yeah, um, we have 16 here. All right. OK, we've. We've got 14 of 16. That might be about it. So right. I, will sh I will share the, res the results. Woo. All right. So 5,000 years, a third of us selected that one. Not too far behind that, 21% of 1,000 years. Uh, equally, an equal number of people thought 500 years. Actually, I'm sorry, 250, 500,000 same amount of people thought that only what maybe one or two people thought a hundred years uh the correct answer is all of them <laughs> and the five thousand years one so um you know i didn't say so the correct answer is five thousand years and to me when i first learned that i did have kind of a an epiphany i was like are you kidding me how is that possible so I, I dug in and wanted to learn some more. So I read this, um, this issue, and the one was age old palms on ancient ridges, okay? And so Dr. Dr. Warren G. Abrahamson, uh, also known as Abe, he calls him, he goes by that. And the Archbold Biological Station has done, you know, they do amazing research, on native plants and natural areas and fire and all sorts of stuff. And um, he wrote this paper uh, and he, he and his wife, Chris actually, and many other students and researchers collaborated over the last 40 years or something to do this work. And um, so let me just briefly describe kind of how he did it. Um, so, 
they took a 20 by 20 meter plot, which is shown here in the top left, and they they took a sample, a leaf sample from every individual um, saw palmetto plant. And then they ran um, like an assay to, to learn about their DNA to see um, if they were all individual plants or if they were related or if they were clones of each other. And they found out that there was actually, you know, not that many unique individuals. And a lot of them were clones of each other that were widely spaced, which is really interesting because, um, you know, that's not something you might think about a saw palmetto, but it's actually a clonal, a clonal creature, plant. And um, let me read to you something from the article, okay? So how is this possible that these plants can live so long and that they can move around a landscape and be many different things? Um, just trying to move the camera here. Okay. So the, individual, the individuals of saw palmetto that we see are most often a small fraction of a much larger palmetto clone composed of genetically identical saw palmettos. As saw palmettos spread along the ground via their horizontal stems, their stems often fork in response to multiple sprouts, damage from fire, mechanical injury, to form additional stems. This clonal trait facilitates the remarkable longevity of saw palmettos that can attain 5,000 and more years of age. So, what a cool plant. It actually, you know, wouldn't that be a neat time lapse is to see the last 5,000 years of this thing, how the saw palmetto moved all over and branched off into, uh, into a large group. A little more detail, like for the science people out here that want to know a little more about, sorry about that, how this works is, um, so, move this again, sorry. As saw palmetto ramets grow, the tail end of their stem dies, eventually causing physical separation of ramets. Um, I'll explain what a ramet is in a minute. So there's two words we need to know, genet and ramet. So first off, we'll start with a genet. A genet is a group of genetically identical plants growing in a given location that have originated vegetatively from a single ancestor. The, gen the genet is composed of individuals that plant ecologists refer to as ramets. A ramet is a physiologically distinct organism that may or may not be connected physically to other members of a genet. Thus, most often the plants of saw palmetto that we see are ramets that are part of a clonal colony or genet. So I know that's a little bit, um, heavy there on like the terminology, but I do like it because it explains what we're seeing here in this picture. So you can see how this saw palmetto has either branched one or two times from a single stem. And you can imagine over hundreds, thousands of years, how those could eventually go in quite different directions. And they're still alive about 5,000 years later, they're just in different places. Um, there's other trees around the world. Maybe you guys can think of from places where you're from, where there's clonal trees. I know the quaking aspen is an example, maybe in the northern parts, which can be, they're not sure, maybe 80,000 years old. And the reason I thought this was interesting to bring up is because how does this inform our environmental ethic, our eco philosophy, when we're walking among plants that have been alive? for 5,000 or more years. I think it should. Here is another picture I took just the other day with um, a tape measure and showing how, um, how long this, this stem is. And it actually branched out right where I put the tape measure at the base of it. It, it branched in two different directions there, forming a Y. And so overall, that that ran, that ran it was eight and a half feet long. So if you did the calculations from 
Dr. Abrahamson's work and using like the average growth rate that he figured out and all that kind of thing, probably 250 years ago or more, these plants separated on their journey and grew apart. Um, you know, I think we're so used to seeing 250 year old trees that are massive and giant and have so much character. You know, imagine a 250 year old oak tree. You might stop and give it a look. Um, hardly ever do we give the sapo meadow a second look and realize that that tree, or sorry, that palm has been around longer than, you know, three human lifetimes right there. And this is just one example. I stepped right over it. <laughs> Didn't give it a thought. So I had a thought after reading this or learning about this and, uh, so after learning about their tremendous age, I can't help but read their common name in a different way. Saw palmetto. Saw, as in the past tense of see. They have seen so much. And, you know, if we maybe took a longer view of our actions and thought, you know, maybe that's kind of what the traditional peoples of the Americas thought, like seven generations. You know, if we thought in saw palmetto time, we would realize that we are, are not making smart choices all the time and we need to have a longer view of things. So to change from a sort of a sciencey edge to a more summer reading list, I wanted to recommend two books that I really love. Um, I know summertime is a you know, they put out summer reading lists. And uh, so here's two of my choices that I like. I am just finishing up Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And I can't recommend it enough. It's just such a beautiful and sad and, and just wonderful story about um, so many things. It's about indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teaching of plants. So if you haven't read it, maybe check it out. Um, I think it's basically it's, you know, eco philosophy and, and prose, which is a lot like poetry almost. So uh, I think the book does a lot better job than I could do about explaining how I feel about nature and our connection to it. And I think reading a book like that can really help us because it's written so well, you know. One other book I wanted to point out was um, The Overstory by Richard Powers. And this one was winner of the Pulitzer Prize. And it's a novel, but it's based on a lot of, you know, five years of research that Richard Powers had done. And, and it's just a wonderful book. Um, you know, I know it's hard to recommend books because we all have such different tastes, but I wanted to uh, talk briefly about something within the story of of the book. <clears throat> okay, so in the book, The Overstory, there's a character called Patricia Westerford. And I learned that it was that that character was actually based on a real person. And her name is Suzanne Samard. She's a doctor of ecology, forest ecology. Um, I forget where, I think in British Columbia. And she is just such a wonderful, wonderful person and so curious and interesting and a great speaker. And um, Andy, I, if you could share in the chat, um, right before I was preparing this talk, NPR on um, Terry Gross interviewed Su uh, Suzanne recently and I think that is a great um a great talk to listen to if you want to because i cannot i can't describe her work in you know 15 minutes it, i wouldn't do it justice and it's wonderful to hear it from the person themselves tell the story so all i want to do today is just ask some questions and point out some really cool things i i learned from her work um she did a lot with how trees communicate and cooperate. I think oftentimes scientists and 
humans in general look at a forest and see all competition. But what she showed me was that there's actually a lot of cooperation too. And in surprising ways too. Um, so the way she did this is she learned about mushrooms and old growth forests. And many mushrooms can form mycorrhizal fungal networks. So that word I just said is mycorrhizal. So I'm doing two screens, mycorrhizal fungus. So what that means is myco means like mushroom and rhizal means like rhizome or a root network. So it's a, it's a fungus that can actually penetrate into the roots of trees. And they do that for a mutualistic reason. The fungus gets the products of photosynthesis from the trees that fungus cannot make. They can't, they can't photosynthesize and they can't make sugars. So they get some delicious treats from the trees. And in exchange, the fungus will give the trees things that it can't readily get, like micronutrients, um, access to water sometimes when there's a drought. And what's really fascinating is the forest is connected through these mycorrhizal networks. Um, there's also a great TED talk by Suzanne um, on just, yeah, Ted, if you typed in her name, you should watch that too, if you want to learn more about this. Um, but something I found really interesting and in, in how this relates to us in, in Florida is, you know, this isn't just doesn't have to be just in British Columbia where she did her work. Because in, in that NPR interview, if you listen to it, she says that um, these processes are happening in all trees and all plants of forests around the world. So I take her word for that, that that means it's happening in our beautiful forests as well. So the other day I took this picture of this mushroom. This was growing right outside the apron of the entrance to a gopher tortoise burrow. So, um, you know, who knows what, I don't know if this is a mycorrhizal fungus. I don't even know the name of this mushroom yet, but, um, I can tell you there are ones that will connect the trees. And something really fascinating, some takeaways that I learned while doing her, um, I'm sorry, some takeaways from her work that I found interesting were that trees of different species would help each other, which you might not assume that could, that could be possible, but um, she found that paper birch and Douglas fir would share resources with each other, you know? And I just thought it was cool that she had a totally different thought and proved it through science that a paradigm that we had been living in of all competition was wrong and that the forest is actually communicating, cooperating in a level that's beyond, um, beyond our almost comprehension in a way. And that's kind of what Richard Powers does a great job in his book about kind of tying some of those ideas into, into words and prose. Um, one other thing that I wanted to say is they can alert each other through micro, mycorrhizal networks of predators and, and threats. So if a beetle is attacking a tree and it's in the area, that tree can send out warning signals through the, through the mycorrhizal network. And other trees can kick up their defenses and be ready for these insects before they even get to the trees. They also can send um, signals through the, throughout the volatile organic compounds in the airs that the trees can pick up on, but humans can't even smell. So there's this unseen world that's going on around us um, and there's so much more happening. Um, one other kind of highlight I will take is that and this kind of really blew my mind was that in her research <clears throat> she found that mother trees can recognize their offspring i was just i took a sip of water there to let that sink in there <laughs> um i'll say it again so they found that mother trees can recognize their offspring from their seeds 
So if a tree falls, a seed falls from a tree and grows in the forest, that mother tree can give that little seedling nutrients through the mycorrhizal network and help it grow. Um, so, you know, when we're clear cutting forests, we're not just cutting individual trees. We're cutting a community that is speaking to each other that is in some ways definitely intelligent in a lot of ways maybe more intelligent than people are and they're even calling these systems biological neural networks and so our brain is a biological neural network that produces thoughts um, sometimes weird thoughts sometimes helpful thoughts but thoughts nonetheless and I can't help but just think outside the box and thinking like, well, is the forest thinking in some way? And if it is, or even if it isn't, how can that understanding guide our eco philosophy, our ethic moving forward? I mean, is it morally correct to, to treat a forest like that? And I know we would all agree that no, it's not, that we're showing no respect for the thing that's supporting us. Um, and that, that's kind of where I, I tie this all back together of the eco philosophy is when we learn about native plants and, and the mushrooms and the intricacy of the connections, we love it more and we appreciate it more and we want to protect it more. So in my mind, that's where eco philosophy can really help inform our actions. Kind of back to my original slide about our own life must be our message. Um, and I love when I, when I just listen to these talks and stuff, uh, you know, they give me new thoughts. And basically, uh, it made me think of this one. So you guys have all heard the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it came to me that it takes a forest to raise a seedling. And that we have to look at the forest as a whole, not individual trees, but things that are helping each other, even from different species. Um, you know, I know we have a, our son Finnegan seven and has taken all our friends and family to help us make it this far. And um, it takes every tree in that, you know, in that forest to, to raise that seedling. And that's literally true. And that's what Suzanne's work is showing. And um, yeah, I, I think I kind of leave it at that and just see what you guys think about that. But um, I want to say thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, my heart goes out to all you guys for uh, all the good work you're doing in the native plant world. And um, I took this picture. I, I found a bunch of kunti seeds laying on the sidewalk where they had fallen off of a kunti. And uh, I just organized them into this little picture. So thank you guys. And I'm, I'll be happy to sit around and uh, talk with anyone or answer questions in the chat. Well, thank you, Eric. That was very, uh, very informative, stimulating, excellent. I think I, uh, on behalf of our chapter and I'm sure all the listeners here, that was, uh, that was a real joy. Something I forgot um, before we started was uh, to welcome uh, any Naples Botanical garden staff or volunteers. Um, we're so excited to have you guys joining us uh, as well as our board members. Um, we have uh, Becky Troop is with us. She is our um, co-treasurer. Uh, we have uh, Karen Allman, uh, our secretary and outreach chair. Um, we also have Connie Nagel with us, who is our membership chair. Um, I also uh, believe Danny Cox is nearby, our YouTube volunteer. Um, and that's Andy's husband. And last but not least, our fearless leader, Andy Nacarado. Uh, she has graciously let me take on hosting uh, to gain some experience. I've had big shoes to fill and hopefully uh, I've done. So um, as Eric said, uh, 
you know, feel free to enter things in the chat. I, there were some comments in there. Um, CJ McCarthy said, absolutely amazing photograph about your mushroom photograph, Eric. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, there was, uh, there were some other comments in there about a, uh, a Ted talk Christy Duff shared. Um, oh, cool. so if anybody wants to take that link down, please do. Um, I've got a couple of questions, Evan, to get the ball rolling. If you don't yeah, mind. go, go ahead. Oh, uh, one more thing, Andy, I just wanted to mention if anybody is on their phone, uh, they can since there's no chat feature for some on the phone, they can also unmute and, and talk. Go ahead. Thank you. So I love thinking about native plants in different ways and from different angles. Um, and I've noticed that I, I can become more contemplative the more I'm outside and in nature. So Eric, I wanted to ask you, how does all of the time that you spend out in nature help you think outside of the box, as you said? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it just does because uh, you get to see so much and then you, you know, I ask myself like, whoa, you know, like that's interesting, I, I, that's so cool. You know, like I just see stuff all the time if you're, if you're paying attention. And um, I mean, kind of back to the native plant thing. I, I wonder though, if like, for instance, when well, I mean, we're doing so much harm to the environment as it is, but like, in addition to bringing in plants from all over the world, that's kind of like another insult in a way because it's, it's hurting these habitats. But there's a part of me that can't help asking the question, <clears throat> you know, what are, this, what are these landscapes look like in 5,000 years um, because I doubt that a plant could remain a monoculture for 5,000 years, um, even something like Brazilian pepper. Um, I mean, maybe it could, but it just seems like it wouldn't. Like eventually it, nature would find a balance if, if we would stay out of it in a way. Um, but do we have that kind of luxury to wait? We don't because you know, we're doing so many other things at the same time. It's just too many, <laughs> too many fronts. But, um, you know, I do believe in the earth's intelligence to heal itself. And I think that's, that's what I see sometimes. So even if I see like a disturbed area and I see all these plants, like weeds that you call them, you know, growing up, even if they're non-native or even invasive, I'm almost appreciative in some ways because like, thank goodness something's growing because you could imagine a, that we damaged the earth so much that nothing grew. Um, so it's just speaking to us in a different way. And I, I, and I think back to your question, Andy, when I'm outside a lot, whether or not these are true or false or, you know, it doesn't really matter. They're just thoughts, but I think you have them when you're outside a lot. And I, I do feel more con con contemplative uh, when I'm kind of, outside just working, but doing a task that isn't too challenging so I can just let my mind wander. <laughs> yeah, thank you for mentioning that you can feel appreciative for even an invasive plant that's growing in a disturbed area. Like you said, at least something is growing. So, so I like that kind of looking at even invasive plants in a different way. A lot of us in the meeting have the background knowledge about all the negative consequences that can happen from invasive plants, you know, crowding out natives, but there, there are reasons to be appreciative as well. Yeah, um, the other thing I, the other, real quick, the other thing I thought about that is um, if, if you're looking at it as a war or like you hate the plant, I just think that's not a that's not a good place to be coming from, um, and I used to be like that. So, I kind of changed my feeling about it. That I don't, you know, that doesn't mean I won't still try to get rid of them and add native plants to the area. But it's it's a different feeling about it. It's not like I I almost feel like you know we brought them here. They have a right to be here in some way too. They're just living their lives. 
Right. I will ask my second question, um, but I wanted to pass on, you've been getting some compliments in the chat while we've started the Q&A uh, right. from Mary Ann, fantastic presentation. You gave us so much to think about. And from Wendy, really enjoyed and learned from the presentation, thank you. And similarly from John, thank you for a great presentation. Well, you're welcome everyone. And, and I hope um, you, you do kind of use those resources as a collaboration with my presentation because, you know, to keep it short, I, I wasn't able to explain them in depth, but, and the people that, that are explaining, that, that did the research will explain them so much better than me. And I think you'll learn so much from them too. Agreed. If you look back through the chat, you'll see a lot of different links uh, for books and TED Talks and um, other articles. So I recommend if there's one that you are really interested in to click on it and it should open in a different browser window for you so you can check it out at your leisure. But my second question for you, Eric, I thought of it while you were talking about the saw palmetto and the fruits and asking if anybody had tasted the fruits. Mm -hmm. And I know I have not tasted the fruits before, but I know they are used in herbal supplements. So the question that came to mind, especially if maybe it's somebody who's new to the area or new to thinking about native plants, how do we know when a wild plant is safe to taste? So you've got to be the most careful with your sense of taste when you're getting to know plants. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, I think the best way is to go with someone who knows already and don't need a lot of anything. <laughs> you know, start, start small. Even like with mushrooms, they say, if you, you know, if, if you're eating a new genera of mushroom, you should eat just a little bit and wait 24 hours and then see how your body reacts. I think that's a, not a bad thing to do is, um, you know, if someone says it's okay, like you trust them and they know the plant and they know that it's edible, try a little of it. And then if you like it, you can try more later if you didn't have an, a reaction to it. But um, I'd be curious to tune in next month and see, see about, you know, the talk in ethnobotany and suggestions. Cause I, you know, I'm not an expert on it. Yeah, I'm really pleased with how our program schedule has lined up lately. I think eco-philosophy leads really well into ethnobotany. Mm -hmm. So they're a good pairing. Um, yeah. I did provide a link to a book about Florida's edible native plants that was published by Peggy Lance. So there's a link for that in the chat. Um, so that's a good resource for you to look through and start to get familiar with native plants that are known to be edible and which parts of the plants to harvest and what time to harvest. There definitely is a lot to learn if you wanna get into learning edible native plants. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to mention too, if I remember correctly, um, Peggy Lance, the author, she's I think one of the original members of the Florida Native Plant Society and that she may have attended every single annual conference for the Florida Native Plant Society. So she's trustworthy. <laughs> she, <laughs> she's she been in the society since the beginning. Wow. That's, that's really great. It's nice to look through all the comments and uh, learn from you guys. And I'll have to check out, there's another TED Talk recommendation I haven't heard of. Emma Morris, but I'll definitely watch that. Um, if I may, I was going to take off my um, my host hat for a second and um, and just mention how uh, even before the talk tonight, since we got a little preview, Andy and I did to your talk, um, I found myself thinking a lot about you know, how to insert the human element back into, uh, you know, what it means to, to be native and, um, and where to draw that line and how to feel about it. And, um, it's, it, it really is a lot to unpack. And, um, I love that, um, 
that we've had this talk for our chapter and um, and for myself because it, it helps me question that. And so, just wanted to thank you specifically for that for bringing a new a new perspective in a way to enjoy nature in its entirety um, and and as a as a oneness. Really, really yeah. appreciate that perspective. Yeah, you're welcome. And, and honestly, I, I'm still, I thought I'd have a better grasp on it at this point, and I don't, which means I probably don't really understand it. And, uh, you know, but I still do believe that we should look at how things evolved over mil millions of years where we weren't here, influencing things and, and, and learn from that and be respectful of that wisdom and not just bring plants over from around the world at hundreds per day. That's just not a good practice, I think, in general. Um, so I don't know. I, I'd be curious if you guys want. You can reach out to me with an email. Um, I could leave you my email with you if you had some. I'd be curious to hear other people's thoughts on that. Um, because I think that it really could open up some interesting discussions on where we fit into the natural world. I, I did have a question too that um, just kind of popped into my head. Um, can you think of, uh, of one or, or maybe a few uh, guiding principles for yourself in the natural areas of the botanical garden? Um, uh, listen, listen to, listen by observing. Um, don't act right away because um, you know, sometimes your actions can have a big influence. You want to make sure you really understand what you're doing first. So a lot of observation um, and just kind of like knowing how little I know and then trying to make the best decision I can, even with that limited knowledge. Um, so, yeah, it kind of slows things down, but that's not a bad thing. You know, when you're deciding whether or not to you know, remove plants from an area or use herbicide or, you know, light something on fire, you better have an understanding of what you're doing and how that's going to affect, how it's going to affect that place. So, yeah. It looks like um, there are a couple more questions here or uh, comments. Uh, lots of questions to ponder. Thanks. That's from Beth. Um, Gene said another good book is Entangled Life, How Fungi Makes or make our worlds change our minds and shape our futures by Merlin Sheldrake. Uh, very good. And there's more about fungi. Uh, Marie says, many thanks for sharing these ideas and thoughts, much to consider. Yeah, you, you know, Evan, one thought about kind of what um, <clears throat> Gene brought up uh, more about fungi. You know, it's almost kind of, um, if we're going to learn about native plants, we almost have to start learning about the fungi that are associated with them because some are like so intricately wound, they're, they're not a separate thing almost, you know? And so it's kind of interesting to think about our bodies is like that too. Like, you know how we have in our human gut, there's all these microbes and bacteria that are doing all these processes for us that we couldn't live without, but they're actually separate species that are living inside us. And that's a lot like the, the um, mycorrhizal thing. And so it does make you question on like where Eric begins and where Eric ends, <laughs> you know, makes me think that. Yeah, nice. Well, uh, on that note, I, um, oh, we do have another comment. Uh, CJ says, oh, he has a question. Wonder how added plants, non-native relate to existing biological neural network? Yeah, I think that's a, you could probably explore that question. Um, and I have no idea, but um, maybe, that was, maybe. That was maybe a rhetorical question. Oh, yeah. But, well, no, but please. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But it, it'd be interesting to consider how non-native plants how if they're introduced quickly, how they can affect that. Hmm. I'm sure they do. Well, I was um, 
I think you could perhaps do a better job that, than I could um, at uh, giving a plug for the Naples Botanical Garden. Sure. Um, yeah, if you guys have not visited before, it's, um, it's a wonderful place where there's a lot of um, gardens that are based around uh, different cultures and areas of the world. So you can come see plants that you won't see anywhere else in probably Naples. And we have a 90 acre um, native preserve with some hiking trails through um, a pine upland and scrubby flatwoods. We have a great birding lookout um, with a, overlooking a kind of a brackish marsh. And there's lots of great birds to see there. So um, if you're a birder and a native plant person, it's a great place to come and, uh, and check it out. And you'll, you know, you'll meet other plant nerds. <laughs> Eric, can you touch on what it's like right now as far as uh, like buying tickets ahead of time if somebody wanted to visit? Yeah, um, I, you know, I should know this better, but they used to have time ticketing where you had to like go on and um, just reserve like a time slot. Uh, that may be relaxing, but um, just check online at naplesgarden.org and it'll give you all the information you need to uh, you know prepare for your visit so you're you know preparing for any restrictions with covid so thank you guys well th thank you so much eric um it's it's been a joy it's been a joy and uh thank you also everybody who's attended um, the live recording. Uh, remember that uh, the recording will be available on our website. Uh, I'd also like to remind you to register for the conference if you're interested, that's this weekend. Um, and to come to Cutting Horse. Uh, if you'd like plants, native plants, one of the best places you can, you can come grab them is uh, at the Cutting Horse Eco Center in Benita. And our next sale there, uh, where some of the profits will go to our chapter, will be on May 29th. So this has been great. Thank you again, Eric. It's been great having you. And, yeah. uh, and we, we appreciate you. Thank you, Evan. Thanks, Andy. Thank you so much, Eric. This was excellent. Good night, everyone. <laughs>